Christ our Savior parts from his most holy mother in Bethany in order to enter upon his sufferings on the Thursday of his Last Supper. The great lady asks to partake of Holy Communion with the rest and afterwards follows with Magdalene and other holy women. Let us now proceed in our history and return to our Savior in Bethany, whither, after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he had returned with his apostles. In the last chapter, we anticipated the course of events in relating what was undertaken by the demons before the betrayal of Christ and what resulted from the infernal consultation, the treachery of Judas and the council of the Pharisees. We will now take up the thread of events in Bethany, where the great queen attended upon and served her divine son during the three days intervening between the Palm Sunday and Monday Thursday. All this time, except what was consumed on Monday and Tuesday in going to Jerusalem and teaching in the temple, the author of life spent with his blessed mother, for on Wednesday he did not go to Jerusalem, as I have already said. On these last journeys he instructed his disciples more clearly and fully concerning the mysteries of his passion and of human redemption. Nevertheless, although they listened to the teachings and forewarnings of their God and Master, each one was affected thereby, only in so far as his disposition allowed and according to the motives and sentiments of his heart. They were always tardy in their response, and in the, weak, in their, in the weakness they fell short of their protestations of zealous love, as the events afterwards showed and as we shall see later on. But to the Most Blessed Mother, our Savior, during the day immediately preceding his passion, communicated such exalted sacraments and mysteries of the redemption and of the new law of grace that many of them will remain hidden until they shall be, shall be revealed in the beatific vision. Of those which I have understood, I can say very little, but into the heart of the great queen her son deposited all that David calls uncertain and hidden of his divine wisdom. Psalms 50, number 50. And number eight, namely, the greater part of the, the secrets of his works add extra, such as our salvation, the glorification of the predestined, and the consequent exaltation of his holy name. The Lord instructed Mary in all that she was to do during his passion and death, and enlightened her anew with divine light. In all these conferences, her most holy son spoke to her with a new and kingly reserve, such as was in harmony with the greatness of the matter treated of. For now the tenderness and caresses of a son and spouse had entirely ceased. But as the natural love of the sweetest mother and the burning charity of her pure soul had now reached a degree above all comprehension of the human mind, and as the conversation and intercourse with her divine son was now drawing to a close, no created tongue can describe the tender and mournful affections of that, pure, that purest of hearts and the size of her inmost soul. <laughs> She was, as the mysterious turtle dove, that already began to feel the approach of that solitude which the company of no creature in heaven or, or on earth could ever relieve or compensate. Thursday, the eve of the passion and death of the Savior had arrived. At earliest dawn, the Lord called to him his most beloved mother, and she, hastening to prostrate herself at his feet, responded, quote, Speak, my Lord and Master, for thy servant heareth, unquote. Raising her up from the ground, he spoke to her in words of soothing and tenderest love, quote, My mother, the hour decreed by the eternal wisdom of my father for accomplishing the salvation and restoration of the human race and imposed upon me by his most holy and acceptable will has now arrived. It is proper that now we subject to him our own will, as we have so often offered to do. Give me thy permission to enter upon my suffering and death, and as my true mother, consent that I deliver myself over to my enemies in obedience to my eternal Father. In this manner, do thou also willingly cooperate with me in this work of eternal salvation, since I have received from thee in, my virgin, in thy virginal womb the form of a suffering and mortal man in which I am to redeem the world and satisfy the divine justice. Just as thou, thy own free will, didst consent to my incarnation, so now I desire thee to give consent also to my passion and death of the cross, to sacrifice me now of thy own free will to the decree of my eternal Father. This shall be the return which I ask of thee for having made thee my mother, for he has sent me in order that by, my suffering, by the sufferings of my flesh I might recover the lost sheep of his house, the children of Adam. Unquote. Matthew 18.11 
<clears throat> These and other words of the Savior spoken on that occasion pierced the most loving heart of Mary and cast her into the throes of a sorrow greater than she had ever endured before. For now had arrived that dreadful hour whence there was no issue for her pains, neither in an appeal to the swift fleeting time nor to any other tribunal against the inevitable decree of the Eternal Father that had fixed the term of her beloved son's life. When now the most prudent mother looked upon him as her God, infinite in his attributes and perfections, and as the true God-man in hypostatical union with the person of the Word, and beheld him sanctified and ineffably exalted by this union with the Godhead, she remembered the obedience he had shown her as his mother during so many years, and the blessings he had conferred upon her during his long intercourse with her. She realized that soon she was to be deprived of this blessed intercourse and of the beauty of his countenance, of the vivifying sweetness of his words, that she was not only to lose all this at once, but moreover, that she was to, liver, to deliver him over into the hands of such wicked enemies, to ignomin ignominies and torments, and how to the bloody sacrifice of a death, and to the bloody sacrifice of a death on the cross. How deeply must all these considerations and circumstances now so clear, clearly before her mind have penetrated into her tender and loving heart and filled it with a sorrow unmeasurable. But with the magnanimity of a queen vanquishing this invincible pain, she prostrated, prostrated herself at the feet of her divine son and master, and in deepest reverence, kissing his feet, answered, quote, Lord and highest God, author of all that has been, has being, Excuse me. Though thou art the son of my womb, I am thy handmaid. The condescension of thy ineffable love alone has raised me from the dust to the dignity of being thy mother. It is altogether becoming that I, vile wormlet, acknowledge and thank thy most liberal clemency by obeying the will of the Eternal Father and thy own. I offer myself and resign myself to his divine pleasure in order that in me, just as in thee, my Son and Lord, his eternal and adorable will be fulfilled. The greatest sacrifice which I can make is that I shall not be able to die with thee, and that our lot should not be inverted, for to suffer in imitation of thee and in thy company would be a great relief for my pains, and all torments would be sweet if undergone in union with thine. That thou shouldest endure all these torments for the salvation of mankind shall be my only relief in my pains. Receive, O oh my God, this sacrifice of my desire to die with thee, and of my still continuing to live, while thou, the most innocent lamb and figure of the substance of thy eternal Father, undergoest death. Hebrews 1, three. Receive also the agonies of my sorrow to see the inhuman cruelty of thy enemies executed on thy exalted person because of the wickedness of the humankind. O ye heavens and elements and all creatures within them, ye sovereign spirits, ye patriarchs and prophets, assist me to deplore the death of my beloved who gave you being and be well with me the misery of men who are the cause of this death and who failing to profit of such great blessings, shall lose that eternal life so dearly bought. O oh, unhappy you that are foreknown, foreknown as doomed! O oh, ye happy predestined who shall wash your stoles in the blood of the Lamb! Apocalypse 7.14 You who knew how to profit by this blessed sacrifice, praise ye the Lord Almighty! O oh, my Son and infinite delight of my soul, give fortitude and strength to thy afflicted mother, Admit her as thy disciple and companion, in order that she may participate in thy passion and cross, and in order that the Eternal Father may receive the sacrifice of thy mother in union with thine. Unquote. With these and other expressions of her sentiments, which I cannot all record in words, the Queen of Heaven answered her most holy son and offered herself as a companion and a cojectrix. There's that word again. In his passion. Thereupon, thoroughly instructed and prepared by divine light for all the mysteries to be wrought by the master of life towards accomplishing all his great ends, the most pure mother, having the Lord's permission, added another request in the following words, quote, Beloved of my soul and light of my eyes, my son, 
I am not worthy to ask thee what I desire from my inmost soul, but thou, O Lord, art the life of my hope, and in this my trust I beseech thee, if such be thy pleasure, to make me a participant in the ineffable sacrament of thy body and blood. Thou hast resolved to institute it as a pledge of thy glory, and I desire in receiving thee sacramentally in my heart to share the effects of this new and admirable sacrament. Well do I know, O Lord, that no creature can ever merit such an exquisite blessing, which thou hast resolved to set above all the works of thy magnificence, and in order to induce thee to confer it upon me, I have nothing else to offer except thy own self and all thy infinite merits. If by perpetuating these merits through the same humanity which thou hast received from my womb creates for me a certain right, let this right consist not so much in giving thyself to me in this sacrament, as in making me thy, thine by this new possession, which restores to me thy sweetest companionship. All my desires and exertions I have devoted to the worthy reception of this holy communion from the moment in which thou gavest me knowledge of it, and ever since it was thy fixed decree to remain in the holy church under the species of consecrated bread and wine. Do thou then, my Lord and God, return to thy first habitation which thou didst find in thy beloved mother and thy slave, whom thou hast prepared for thy reception by exempting her from the common touch of sin. Then shall I receive within me the humanity which I have communicated to thee from my own blood, and thus shall we be united in a renewed and close embrace. This prospect, this prospect enkindles my heart with the most ardent love, and may I, may I never be separated from thee, who art the infinite God, good and love of my soul. Unquote. That right there should tell you how... precious and holy the Eucharist is. Many words of incomparable love and reverence were spoken on that occasion by the Queen and Lady, for in the wonderful love of her heart she sought of her most holy Son the privilege of participating in a sacred body and blood. The Lord on his part answered her with great tenderness and granted her request promising her the blessing of Holy Communion at the hour of its institution. The purest mother, in deepest devotion, broke out in heroic acts of humility, thankfulness, reverence, and living faith in ex expectation of the desired participation in the Most Holy Eucharist. Then happened what I shall relate next. <clears throat> the Savior commanded the holy angels of her guard to attend upon her in visible forms and to serve and console her in her sorrow and loneliness. With this commanded, they compl complied most faithfully. The Lord also expressed his desire that after his departure for Jerusalem with his disciples, she should follow shortly after in company with the holy women who had accompanied them from Galilee, and that she should instruct and encourage them in order that they might not be scandalized in seeing him suffer the great ignominies and torments of the frightful death of the cross. At the close of this interview, the Son of the Eternal Father gave his blessing to his beloved mother and prepared to enter upon that last journey which led to his suffering and death. The sorrow which filled the hearts of both son and mother passes all conception of man, for it was proportioned to the love they had for each other, and this love again was proportioned to the dignity and greatness of the persons concerned. But although we can so little describe it in words, we are not free to exempt ourselves from meditating upon it and following them in their sorrowful journey with the deepest compassion. For if we neglect to do so, as far as our strength and ability permits, we cannot avoid being reprehended as hard-hearted ingrates. <clears throat> our Savior, having thus parted with his most beloved mother and sorrowful spouse, and taking along with him all his apostles a little before midday of the Thursday of the Last Supper, departed on his last journey from Bethany to Jerusalem. At the very outset he raised his eyes to the Eternal Father, and confessing him in words of thankfulness and praise, again professed his most ardent love, and most lovingly and obediently offered to suffer and die for the redemption of the human race. This prayer and sacrifice of our Savior and Master sprang from such ineffable love and ardor of his spirit that it cannot be described. All that I say of it seems to me rather a gainsaying of the truth and of what I desire to say. Quote, Eternal Father and my God, unquote, said Christ our Lord, quote, in compliance with thy holy will, I now go to suffer and die for the liberation of men, 
my brethren, and creatures of thy hands. I deliver myself up for their salvation and to gather those who have been scattered and divided by the sin of Adam. John 11:52. I go to prepare the treasures by which the creatures made according to thy image and likeness. By which the creatures made according to thy image and likeness are to be enriched and adorned so that they may be restored to the height of thy friendship and to eternal happiness and in order that thy holy name may be, may be known and exalted among all creatures. As far as shall depend upon thee and me, no soul, sh soul shall be deprived of a salvation most abundant, and thy inviolate equity shall stand justified in all those who despise this copious redemption." Unquote. Then following the author of life, the most blessed mother, in the company of Magdalene and of the other holy women who had attended upon the Savior and had followed him from Galilee, took leave of Bethany. In the same manner as the divine master instructed his apostles and prepared them for his passion, in order that they might not desert him on account of the ignominies that were to witness, they were to witness, and on account of the temptations of Satan, so also the queen and mistress of all virtues exerted herself in preparing the devoted band of her disciples for witnessing courageously the death and the frightful scourging and torments of their divine master, and the, she capitalized death. <clears throat> Although, on account of their feminine nature, these women naturally were more frail and weak than the apostles, yet some of them showed much more fortitude in adhering to the teachings and in rely, relying on the previous exhortations and examples of their great mistress and queen. Among them all, as the evangelists relate, Mary Magdalene distinguished herself, for she was entirely consumed in the flames of her love, and even naturally she was of a magnanimous, courageous, and energetic disposition, well educated and full of a noble fealty, fidelity. She, before all others of the apostolate, had taken it upon herself to accompany the master, the mother of Jesus, and attend upon her during the entire passion, and this her resolve she fulfilled as the most faithful friend of the blessed mother. The most holy mother imitated and joined the Savior in his prayer, and the offering which he made at this time. For as I have often said, in the clear mirror furnished her by the divine light, she was made to see all the works of her divine Son in order that she might imitate them as closely as possible. The holy angels of her guard, obeying the orders of the Savior, accompanied and attended upon her in visible forms. With these heavenly spirits, she conversed about the great sacrament of, this pa of the Passion, which was yet hidden to her companions and to all the human creatures. They well perceived and deeply pondered the measureless conflagration of love in the pure and candid heart of the mother and the force with which they saw her drawn after the sweet ointments of mutual love between her and Christ, her son, spouse, and redeemer. They presented to the Eternal Father the sacrifice of praise and expiation offered to him by his firstborn and only daughter among the creatures. Since all the mortals were insensible of this benefit and of the indebtedness in which they were placed, by the love of Christ their Lord and his blessed mother, she ordered the holy angels to give benediction, glory, and honor to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and they eagerly fulfilled the wish of their great princess and queen. Words fail me, and worthy sentiments of sorrow, for expressing properly what I understood of the, on this occasion concerning the amazement of the holy angels, when on the one hand they saw the incarnate word and his most holy mother, wending their way in most ardent love of mankind toward the accomplishment of man's redemption, and on the other beheld the vileness, ingratitude, and hard-hearted neglect of men concerning their obligations consequent upon this blessing, a blessing which would, which would have moved to recognition even the demons if they had been the objects of such benefit. The amazement of the angels arose not only from any ignorance on their part, but from indignation at our unbearable ingratitude. I am but a weak woman, and less than a wormlet of the earth, but in the light which has been given me concerning this matter, I wish to raise up my voice, so that it may be heard through all the world, and rouse up the children of vanity and lovers of deceit, Canticles 1, 3, to a sense of their obligation toward Christ and his holy mother. Prostrate on the ground, I wish to implore all men not to be so dull of heart and hostile to themselves, as not to rise from this stupor of forgetfulness, which keeps us in constant danger of eternal death and deprives of us of the celestial life and happiness merited for us by the Redeemer and Lord and by the bitterness of the cross.
Instruction given me by the Queen of Heaven, Most Holy Mary. My daughter, as thy soul has been furnished with special gifts of enlightenment, I call and invite thee anew to cast thyself into the sea of mysteries contained in the passion and death of my divine Son. Direct all thy faculties and strain all the powers of thy heart and soul to make thyself at least somewhat worthy of understanding and meditating upon the ignominies and sorrows of the Son of the Eternal Father in his death on the cross for the salvation of men, and also of considering my doings and sufferings in connection with his bitterest passion. This science, so much neglected by men, I desire that thou, my daughter, study and learn, so as to be able to follow thy, follow thy spouse and imitate me, who am thy mother and teacher. Writing down and feeling deeply all that I shall teach thee of these mysteries, thou shouldest detach thyself entirely of human and earthly affections, and of thy own self, so as freely to follow our footsteps in destitution and poverty. And since I do thee the special favor of calling thee aside to instruct thee in fulfillment of the will of my holy Son, and since we seek through thee to teach others, thou shouldest correspond with to this copious redemption as if it was solely for thy benefit and as if all of it would be lost if thou dost not profit by its blessings so much must thou esteem it for in the love which caused my most holy son to die for thee he looked upon thee with as great an affection as if thou hadst been the only one that needed the remedy of his passion and death this is the standard by which thou must measure thy obligations and thy gratitude since thou then both seest the base and dangerous forgetfulness of men in regard to this benefit, and knowest that for, thou, for these very men their God and Creator had died, it should be thy earnest endeavor to compensate him for their neglect by thy ardent love, as if the proper return for his benefits was left entirely to thy fidelity and gratitude alone. At the same time, grieve over the blind folly of men in despising eternal felicity and in treasuring up for themselves the wrath of the Lord by frustrating the boundless effects of his love for the world. This is the purpose for which I make known to thee so many secrets, and my unparalleled sorrow in the hour of his parting from me to go to his sacred sufferings unto death. There are no words which can describe the bitterness of my soul on that occasion, but the contemplation of it should cause thee to esteem no hardship great to seek no rest or consolation on earth except to suffer and die for Christ. Do thou sorrow with me, for this faithful correspondence is due to me, who favor thee with these graces. I wish thee also to ponder what a horrible crime it is in the eyes of the Lord, in mine, and in those of all the saints, that men should despise and neglect the frequent reception of the Holy Communion, and that they should approach it without preparation and fervent devotion principally in order that thou mayest understand and record this warning. I have manifested to thee what I did on that occasion and how I prepared myself so many years for receiving my most blessed Son in the Holy Sacrament, and also the rest which thou art yet to write for the instruction and confusion of men. <clears throat> for if I, who was innocent of any hindering sin and filled with all graces, sought to increase my fitness for this favor by such fervent acts of love humility and gratitude, consider what efforts thou and the other children of the church, who every day and hour incur new guilt and blame, must make in order to fit yourselves for the beauty of the divinity and humanity of my most holy Son. What excuse can those men give in the last judgment who have despised this ineffable love and blessing which they had always present in the holy church, ready to fill them with the plenitude of his gifts? and who rather sought diversion and worldly pleasures, and attended upon the outward and deceitful vanities of this earthly life. Be thou amazed at this insanity, as were the holy angels, and guard thyself against falling into the same error. <clears throat> Christ our Savior celebrates the Last Supper with his disciples according to the law, and he washes their feet. His Most Holy Mother obtains a full knowledge and understanding of all these mysteries. <clears throat> our Redeemer, procured on, 
proceeded on his way to Jerusalem on the evening of the Thursday preceding his passion and death. During their con conversation on the way, while he instructed them in the approaching mysteries, the apostles proposed their doubts and difficulties, and he, as the teacher of wisdom and as a loving father, answered them in words which sweetly penetrated into their very hearts. For, having always loved them, he, like a divine swan, in these last hours of his life, manifested his love with so much the greater force of amiable sweetness in his voice and manner. The knowledge of his impending passion and the prospect of his great torments not only did not hinder him in the manifestations of his love, but, just as fire is more concentrated by the frost, so his love broke forth with so much the greater force <clears throat> at the prospect of these sufferings. Okay. The conflagration of the love which burned in the heart of Jesus issued forth to overpower by its penetrating activity first those who were nearest about him, and then also those who sought to extinguish it forever. Excepting Christ and his blessed mother, the rest of us mortals are ordinarily roused to resentment by injury, or dismayed and disgusted by adversity, and we deem it as a great thing not to revenge ourselves on those who offend us. But the love of the Divine Master was not daunted by the impending ignominies in the, of his passion, nor dampened by the ignorance of his apostles and the disloyalty which he was so soon to experience on their part. The apostle asked him where he wished to celebrate the Paschal Supper, Matthew 26, for on that Thursday night, <clears throat> excuse me, For on that Thursday night the Jews were to partake of the Lamb of the Pash, a most notable and solemn national feast, though all of their feasts though of all their feasts, this eating of the Paschal Lamb was most prophetic and significant of the Messiah and of the mysteries connected with him and his work. The apostles were as yet scarcely aware of its intimate connection with Christ. The Divine Master answered by sending Saint Peter and Saint John to Jerusalem to make arrangements for the Paschal Lamb. This was to be in a house where they would see a servant enter with a jug of water and whose master they were to request in Christ's name to prepare a room for his last supper with his disciples. This man lived near Jerusalem, rich and influential. He was at the same time devoted to the Savior and was one of those who had witnessed and had believed in his miracles and teachings. The author of life rewarded his piety and devotion by choosing his house for the celebration of the great mystery and thus consecrated as a temple for the faithful of future times. The two apostles immediately departed on their commission, and following the instructions, they asked the owner of this house to entertain the master of life for the solemn celebration of this feast of the unleavened bread. <clears throat> the heart of this householder was enlightened by special grace, and he readily offered his dwelling with all the necessary furniture for celebrating the supper according to the law. He assigned to them a very large hall, appropriately tapestried and adorned for the mysteries which, unbeknown to him and the apostles, the Lord was to celebrate therein. After due preparation had thus been made, the Savior and the other apostles arrived at the, this apartment. His most blessed mother and the holy women in her company came soon after. Upon entering, the most humble queen prostrated herself on the floor and adored her divine son as usual asking his blessing and begging him to let her know what she was to do. He bade her go to another room, where she would be able to see all that was done on this night, according to the decrees of Providence, <clears throat> and where she was to console and instruct, as far as was proper, the holy women of her company. The great lady obeyed and retired with her companions. She exhorted them to persevere in faith and prayer, while she, knowing that the hour of her Holy Communion was at hand, continued to keep her interior vision riveted on the doings of her Most Holy Son, and to prepare herself for the worthy reception of his body and blood. His Most Holy Mother, having retired, our Lord and Master Jesus, with his apostles and disciples, took their places to celebrate the Feast of the Lamb. He observed all the ceremonies of the law, Exodus 12.3, as prescribed by himself through Moses. During this last supper he gave to the apostles an understanding of all the ceremonies of the figurative law, as observed by the patriarchs and prophets. He showed them how beneath it was 
how beneath it was hidden the real truth, namely, all that he himself was to accomplish as Redeemer of the world. He made them understand that now the law of Moses and its figurative meaning was evacuated by its real fulfillment, that as the light of the new law of grace had begun to shine, the shadows were dispelled, and the natural law, which had been reconfirmed by the precepts of Moses, was now placed permanently upon its real foundation, ennobled and perfected by his own teachings. That the efficacy of the sacraments of the new law abrogated those of the old as being merely figurative and ineffectual. He told them that, by celebrating the supper, he set an end to the rights and obligations of the old law, which was only a preparation and a representation of what he was now about to accomplish, and hence, having attained its end, had now become useless. This instruction enlightened the apostles concerning the deep mysteries of this last supper. The other disciples that were present did not understand these mysteries as thoroughly as the apostles. <clears throat> Judas attended to and understood them least of all, yea, not at all, for he was completely under the spell of his avarice, thinking only of his prearranged treason and how he could execute it most secretly. The Lord revealed none of his secret treachery, for so it, it best served the designs and equity of his most high providence. He did not wish to exclude him from the supper and from the other mysteries, leaving it to his own wickedness to bring about his exclusion. The Divine Master always treated him as his disciple, apostle, and minister, and was careful of his honor. Thus he taught the children of the church by his own example, with, wh with what veneration they should treat his ministers and priests, how they must guard their honor and avoid speaking of their sins and weaknesses, still adhering to frail human nature in spite of their high office. None of them will ever be worse than Judas, as we can well assume, and not one of the faithful will ever be like Christ, our Lord and Savior, nor, as our faith teaches us, will anyone ever have his divine authority and power. Hence, as all men are of infinitely smaller consideration than our Savior, let them accord to his ministers, who, though wicked, will ever be better than Judas, the same treatment as he condescended to accord to this most wicked disciple and apostle. This duty toward priests is not less urgent even in superiors, for also Christ our Lord, who bore with Judas and was so careful of his reputation, was infinitely his superior. On this occasion, the Redeemer composed a new canticle by which he exalted the Eternal Father for having in his Son fulfilled the figures of the old law, and for thus advancing the glory of his holy name. Prostrate upon the earth, he, he humiliated himself in his humanity before God, confessing, adoring, and praising the divinity as infinitely superior to his humanity. Then addressing the Eternal Father, he gave vent to the burning affection of his heart in the following sublime prayer. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Quote, My Eternal Father and Infinite God, Thy divine and eternal will resolved to create this my human nature, in order that I may be the head of all those that are predestined for thy glory and happiness, and who are to attain their true blessedness by availing themselves of my works. For this purpose, and in order to redeem them from the fall of Adam, I have lived with them thirty-three years. Now, my Lord and Father, the opportune and acceptable hour for fulfilling thy eternal will has arrived. The greatness of thy holy name is about to be revealed to men and thy incomprehensible divinity, through holy faith, is to be made known and exalted among all nations. It is time that the seven-sealed book be opened, as thou hast commissioned me to do, and that the figures of old come to a happy solution. Apocalypse 5, 7. The ancient sacrifices of animals, which prefigure the one I am now voluntarily to make of myself for the children of Adam, for the members of my mystical body, for the sheep of thy flock, must now come to an end, and I beseech thee in this hour to look down with an eye of mercy. If in the past thy anger has been placated by these ancient figures and sacrifices which I am now about to abrogate, let it now, my father, be entirely extinguished, since I am ready to offer myself in voluntary sacrifice to die for men on the cross and give myself as a holocaust of my love. Ephesians 5.2 
Therefore, Lord, let the rigor of thy justice be relaxed, and look upon the human race with eyes of mercy. Let us institute a new law for men, by which they may throw down the bars of their disobedience and open for themselves the gates of heaven. Let them now find a free road and open portals for entering with me upon the vision of thy divinity, as many of them as will follow my footsteps and obey my law." Unquote. The Eternal Father graciously received this prayer of our Redeemer and sent innumerable hosts of his angelic courtiers to assist at the wonderful works which Christ was to perform in that place. While this happened in the cynical, Most Holy Mary in her retreat was raised to highest contemplation in which she witnessed all the past as if she were present. Thus she was enabled to cooperate and correspond as a most faithful helpmate, enlightened by the highest wisdom. By heroic and celestial acts of virtue, she imitated the doings of Christ, our Savior, for all of them awakened fitting resonance in her bosom and caused a mysterious and divine echo of the petitions and prayers in the sweetest virgin. Moreover, she composed new and admirable canticles of praise for all that the sacred humanity of Christ was now about to accomplish in obedience to the divine will and in accordance and in fulfillment of the figures of the old law. Very wonderful and worthy of all admiration would it be for us, as it was for the holy angels, and as it will be for all the blessed, if we can understand the divine harmony of the works and virtues in the heart of our great queen, which, like a heavenly chorus, neither confused nor hindered each other in their superabundance on this occasion. Being filled with the intelligence of which I have spoken, she was sensible of the mysterious fulfillment and accomplishment of the ceremonies and figures of the old law, through the most noble and efficacious sacraments of the new. She realized the vast fruits of the redemption and the predestined, the ruin of the reprobate, the exaltation of the name of God and of the sacred humanity of Christ, the widespread knowledge and faith in the true God now beginning throughout the world. She fully understood how the heavens had been closed for so many ages in order that now the children of Adam might enter through the establishment and progress of the new evangelical church and its ministers, and how her divine Son was the most wonderful and skillful artificer of all these blessings, exciting the admiration and praise of all the courtiers of heaven. For these magnificent, magnificent results, without forgetting the least of them, she now blessed the Eternal Father and gave him ineffable thanks in the consolation and jubilee of her soul. But also she reflected that all these admirable works were to cost her divine Son the sorrow, ignominies, affronts, and torments of his passion, and at last the bitter death of the cross, all of which he was in, to endure in the very humanity that he had received from her, while at the same time such a number of the children of Adam, for whom he suffered, would ungratefully waste the copious fruit of the redemption. This knowledge filled with bitterest sorrow the purest heart of the loving mother. But as she was a living and faithful reproduction of her most holy son, all these sentiments and operations found room in her magnanimous and expanded heart, and therefore she was not disturbed nor dismayed, nor did she fail to console and instruct her companions. But, without losing touch of her high intelligences, she descended to their level of thought in her words of consolation of, and of eternal life for their instruction. O oh, admirable instructress and superhuman example entirely to be followed and imitated! It is true that in comparison with this sea of grace and light, our prerogatives dwindle into insignificance. But it is also true that our sufferings and trials, in comparison with hers, are so to say only imaginary and not worthy to be even noticed, since she suffered more than all the children of Adam together. Yet neither in order to imitate her nor for our eternal welfare can we be induced to suffer with patience even the least adversity. All of them excite and dismay us and take away our composure. We give vent to our passions, we angrily resist, and are consumed with restless sorrow. In our stubbornness we lose our reason, give free rein to evil movements, and hasten on toward the precipice. Even good fortune lures us to destruction, and so no reliance can be placed in our infected and spoiled nature. Let us be mindful of our heavenly mistress on such occasions, in order that we may set ourselves right. And that's where I'm going to end this evening. Praise, glory, and honor be to our Lord Jesus Christ who suffered so much for us. May God bless and keep you.